What's up, Budget Wargamer? We're back, and we're going to talk a little bit about some more Death Watch news. Now, I haven't been able to find any official and more announcements from Games Workshop regarding the upcoming pre-orders of Death Watch, but I have found some unofficial leaks through Fayette 2012, aka natfka.blogspot.com, and they come by way of one of the other YouTube channels out there called Winter SEO. So I've seen him do a lot of codex reviews, and he always seems to get his hands on them a week or two in advance. So I don't know what his official stance are in the Warhammer community or in the Warhammer universe, whether he's just a stockist that likes to divulge information ahead of time, whether he's a part of the team. I don't know his backstory, but if you want to check him out on YouTube, pay him some respects. You can check out Winter SEO. He does do a lot of Warhammer 40k videos. So let's take a moment and dive in here on Fayette 2012, and let's take a look at some of the goodness that he's brought to us. So first and foremost, mainly throughout his entire video as I, as I skim through it, you're just pretty much taking a look at the art and the models that go into the Death Watch Codex, of which there's a lot of great full-color glorious artwork there within that. So here's just a little snippet of it. There's plenty in there. He talks for a long time showing you lots of details. So these are some little snippets that come out of the pages as he's turning it and these are what are on Blogspot. So I don't take credit for any of these but I did want to talk about them at some points. So here's the Ultimaris Decree and it says when he learned of the Death Watch, Robo Gumein immediately recognized their importance. He also saw how thinly stretched the resources of the Death Watch were. In some places the Great Rift had cut watch forces off from any support. In others Furious warp storms drove desperate Xenos migrations before them, leaving the Death Watch and battled against waves of displaced enemies that had nothing left to lose. So this is talking about some of these uh, great events that took place recently in the Warhammer 40k universe. And then also, we've got to build that backstory of how Primaris Marines now become a part of the Death Watch force. Because up until 8th edition, there had never been Primaris Marines in the, in the Death Watch Force. And if you watched our last video where we did a breakdown of Primaris kill teams specifically and the special rules that go along with adding certain models into those units, you'll, you'll kind of wonder, as I did, how did the Primaris Marines get in the Death Watch in the first place? This has to be a relatively new addition, so we'll keep reading here. Foreseeing that Humanity's Shield would soon be sundered without aid, Gulman issued the Ultimaris Decree. This order bound every newly founded Primaris Space Marine chapter to the tithe of the Death Watch in perpetuity. So it's like the Black Watch if you've ever watched the Game of Thrones. So it also second, seconded several chapters worth of the newly awakened Primaris Battle Brothers and deployed them along with all their supporting materiel. That's ma material, I guess, in, in uh, other English directly to the watch fortresses scattered across the Imperium. So desperate was the hour that nearly every watchmaster accepted these untested new recruits without question. Soon enough, the Primaris Marines' might was proven and put to good use. Well, of course, the Primaris Marines do seem to be superior to their tactical brethren in every single way, but this at least builds the backstory of how all of a sudden in 8th edition we've got brand new models and how they work their way into the Death Watch. So that explains some of the backstory. Some more of that glorious full-color artwork where we've got a jump pack marine with a storm shield, another one with a thunder hammer, knocking out some necrons. We've got one with a heavy bolter, just totally showing the mixed prowess of a kill team. This, of course, being a tactical kill team or your normal non-primaris kill team. So they are burning away. and that, I guess that's the uh, heavy bolter slash heavy flamer combi weapon. So let's take a look here at the codex. This is a snippet, and I have to say, uh, I do believe that these are the actual rules. I don't think that Winter SEO or Fayette have an, an intention of faking up the entire sheet here, but I can't say that I have had these in my own hands, so I can't. You just have to take them with a grain of salt. They could potentially be faked, but they'd be a very good fake if that were the case. So we look at the Intercessor Marines and their abilities, 6-inch move, 3+, plus, 3+, plus, 4+, plus, or 4, 4, 2, 2, 7, 3 plus. So they have a standard intercessor stat line. Anything stand out to you guys at first glance as being your regular? And I'd have to say no, at least on the stat line. So this goes into a little bit of an addition. If you want to watch the full breakdown of how the special rules work, um, I'll tag this video, my previous video at the end of how to explain how Primaris kill teams actually work in Warhammer 40k. So this will give us some backing rules, and you can use this screenshot together with that. So it says, this unit contains one intercessor sergeant and four intercessors. And it may include 
up to five additional models of any combination of either intercessors, hellblasters, inceptors, reavers, and aggressors. So that stands um, to back up what we had from the Warhammer community announcement and the rules that they brought in. Here goes over each of what's included with them and the weapon stat lines. So then we have war gear options. So you could dive into that. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but it basically allows you to have some weapons combinations for the reavers, aggressors, and scepters, and so on and so forth, hell blasters that you would put there into the unit. So you get a mixed unit. It says a unit of intercessors can contain models with different toughness characteristics, aka the aggressor and the inceptor. Um, if this is the case, use the toughness characteristic of the majority of the models in the unit, which would always be the um, in intercessors, at least at the beginning. And when the enemy makes wound rolls against it, if there are no majority, the Death Watch player may choose which of the values is used. For the purposes of determining what models a vehicle can transport, aggressors and inceptors have the Mark X Gravis keyword, and inceptors have the Jump Pack keyword, meaning that they really can't fit themselves into any of the transports. So that's key to remember. So we have the Auxiliary Grenade Launcher, of which you can bring about. If a model is equipped with an Auxiliary Grenade Launcher, increase the range of any grenade weapon they have to 30 inches. <laughs> it's a shame you can't do that with the Reaver Shot Grenade, but um, that would be really tough. Crushing charge, D, uh, roll a d6 each time an Inceptor finishes a charge move within an inch of an enemy, and on a six it suffers, suffers a mortal wound. That's neat. It, of course, only um, has an effect if you bring any Inceptors into your mixed unit. You've got Inceptor Strike, um, Grapnel Launchers, Terror Troops from the Reavers, Firestorm from the Aggressors, and Relentless Advance. So definitely watch that video of which we did an explana deep explanation with models on the table of what takes place when you're um, kitting out your Primaris kill team in your Death Watch army. But this is a semi-official, um, trustworthy rule that would help support that. Here's a breakdown of special issue, special issue ammunition. And I don't think we've seen this yet. We've certainly seen some of the other special uh, rules and some of the stratagems of the Death Watch up to this point. So these are the special issue ammunitions. Uh, I don't have the 7th edition codex here to compare how these differ in any sort of way, but it's presumable that they would be somewhat different than their 7th edition counterparts from the old Death Watch Codex. So we've got the Dragonfire Bolt, which adds one to the to hit rolls for this weapon when targeting a unit that is in cover. So that's somewhat situational. A Hellfire Round is seems very, very useful. It says this weapon always wounds on a 2+, plus, except vehicles and Titanic units. So that would be very advantageous at being used to be um, bring down monstrous creatures, whether it's your opponent's Hive Tyrant, Things like that, as long as it's not a vehicle or considered a titanic unit. And then a Kraken Bolt adds 3 inches to the range of the weapon if it's a pistol, or 6 inches otherwise. And it improves the AP of the attack by 1. So that's a very good anti-troop weapon there. And giving you longer range of your bolt rifles. Um, th this would make them quite long ranged at that point. Almost like a sniper rifle. A Vengeance Round subtracts 3 from the range of the weapon if it's a pistol or 6 inches otherwise and improves the AP of the attack by 2. So that would really make, at closer range, the Vengeance Rounds would negate quite a bit of armor value on the bolt rifles that the um, Primaris Intercessors seem to have. So let's go through. I think there was one more list here. Yep, one last page. And this breaks down the normal... Death Watch kill team. So we've talked about the Primaris kill team, and then this is more of your 7th edition style um, regular kill team that could have Terminators, Bikers, um, Veterans, Watch Sergeant, guys with jump packs, things like that, you name it. And then let's go through a deep dive. It does look like they may be able to pick up some of the, the combined special rules as well when you bring another unit into, the, into that. So um, I don't think it's quite as good as the Primaris because I'm looking at Relentless Assault. When you had a biker, atonement through honor, when you had a black shield, things like that. So definitely something to um, take a look at prior to it. Because th these two units are going to be the bulk of what make up most of the 8th edition Death Watch armies. So this is what you're going to need to know if you're a little bit impatient and can't wait the next six days to get your hands on your own official codex. And it's understandable that a lot of people may feel that way. So here's another thing I want to do real quick. We haven't taken a moment to thank a lot of the new people who have joined, and we have had a massive amount of people jump in and join the channel. Much appreciated, guys, guys and gals, presumably, over the last few videos that we've done. So let's scroll through. So I might not get to everybody as YouTube doesn't tell me everybody's name when they subscribe, but there was quite a few of you that it did. So 
Uh, and if I butcher your names, I apologize. Rikerantz, Maxim Valeris, thank you very much. Pau Stani, Nick Standing, quite a few more. Adsilad, Adsilad 1991. William, just straight up William. That's an easy one. Shusky419, Sean McGuire, Sam Hoogie, Dan Reeves, Ryan Negron, Pat Ray, Luke Bat, Casper Bjorstrup, and so many more. Thank you guys for joining the channel. Um, hopefully you guys like to stay tuned. We probably won't be doing too many more Death Watch videos um, after the release. So we anticipate that this week there will be a lot more leaks leading up to the new release of the Death Watch. Games Workshop has typically done a very strong last push through the uh, Warhammer community website and Warhammer Live on their Twitch.tv channel. But um, after it's launched out, we expect to fully go into the following week's new releases. And then I owe some people some hobby videos around here. Uh, I've been doing just basically assembly and priming. Haven't really gotten into painting, but perhaps I'll paint up one of those Forge World Dreadnoughts for my Adeptus Custodes, if those are still in fashion. But what armies are you guys into? Comment below to let me know. I'm into a lot of different games. I've got Shadespire down here on the ground, Star Wars Legion. Um, I'm waiting on the new 8th edition for Kill Team, and I've an anticipated that by picking up my own box of Gene Steeler Colts Neophyte Hybrids, because one, I would probably never ever play Gene Steeler Colts otherwise, so I picked those up for the dual purpose of playing in Warhammer 40k Kill Teams, and because they also are good, um, or I shouldn't say good, but they're also capable of being played in Necromunda, so if I ever get around to officially playing that game, I'll have that army. Uh, but I've got things from... Wrath of Kings, I've got things from um, War, uh, War Machine Hordes, you know, all kinds of stuff. And sometimes I just pick up models because I like them. I've got the, like a lot of the Mousling models from uh, Reaper, from the Bone series. Uh, but really from top to bottom, I've got Age of Sigmar, Warhammer 40k, and then up here, mostly Forge World. But, um, you know, because I have my Death, uh, my Death Corps of Krieg um, assembly back there, and I've got to put together some more of the Grenadiers. Not really using that army to play, but more because I've always wanted to collect them since they came out and finally was able to get my hands on some of them. Uh, but I've got a massive amount of Adeptus Custodes back there. So what are, what are your guys' collections? Um, comment below what your current armies are and what you're looking forward to in 8th edition 40k now that it's been out for a while and we're finally getting a lot of these codexes. Stay tuned to Budget Wargamer for some more great videos.